phrase I liked that I learned from my sister-in-law was, no pasa nada. It's all good, man. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, anyway, my name is Mike. I am a developer advocate at a security company called Sysdig. We do uh, cloud and, and uh, cloud native open source uh, security. We are the uh, company that donated Falco to the open source, or to the CNCF. Falco recently graduated, so like two weeks Woo! ago for us. So that yeah. was awesome. uh, So I've been in about nine years in the cloud native space. I, uh, I was at Docker in about 2014, 2015. And yeah, and then, uh, and then from there I went to AWS, I spent some time at Google, and now I'm over at Sysdig. And then before that I was at uh, VMware where I was doing virtualization stuff. So I've been in virtualization and containers for like about 15 years. Um, if you want to follow me, I'm Mike G. Coleman everywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, because oh, we got the thing, yeah. I recall Central Park. I cannot pick up a microphone without singing. Anyway, so uh, this is, uh, we're going to go through and we're going to talk a little bit about the cloud native security landscape. This was basically born out of my own confusion, and I figured if I was confused, other people were confused as well. So we'll take a look at the landscape, we'll talk about what a CNAP is, and then we'll kind of map that to open source software. So um, the objective here is not to teach you how to use these tools, it's just so you know what they are. Right, and I said, I'll explain like why I, I thought this was an interesting talk. Um, we're gonna talk about a bunch of different tools. Some of the tools can be in multiple categories. Falco is one of those tools. Uh, most cases, I'll just mention them one time, but they have other applications. And this is far, far, far from a comprehensive list. Right, I'm gonna talk about like nine or 10 projects out of the 100 or so that are listed on the landscape side. Um, so the reason I did this was, what, oh my. Uh, one moment, please. Okay, so hopefully that comes back. The reason I did this talk was, if you think about cloud native applications um, and securing cloud native, you're securing across all kinds of different things, right? You've got, you know, cloud services like buckets and databases. You've got identity and access management. Um, you have got the whatever platform you're running on, whether that's uh, serverless or virtual machines or Kubernetes. Um, you've got all, all your network policies. There's like about 15 different levels of security in cloud native in general, right? And, and we do all kinds of really interesting things where we make mistakes. How many of you, and I will only ask you questions where I, the answer is yes for me, how many of you have ever over-provisioned like uh, a security account, a service account or something? Like <laughs> S3 full access, right? How many is that, right, when you shouldn't? I've done that. Corey Quinn, who has 100,000 followers, pointed out to everybody on Twitter that I did it, so that was nice of him. Um, how many of you ever pushed a AWS secret key up to GitHub? Nobody else, someone's lying in this room. Or, or, or an Azure, or Google, any, anyway, how many of you pushed credentials up to GitHub in a public repository, right? Those, so there's all these areas where you can just make a mistake. Right, so, so you think, okay, well there's gotta be a lot of things that can help me with that. So then you go to CNCF and you're like, they know everything about cloud native, so let's look at the security. Oh wow, wow, there's a lot of stuff on there. There's something called Claire. Does anybody know what Claire does? I, I don't pick Claire, I'm not picking on Claire, I just don't know. Oh, what? Thank you very much. You've got the magic power. Um, anyway, there's all these things on here, right? So then you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna go and get some Armo, and I'm gonna put that together with some outside and some Orca, and, and right, it's just really confusing. When you think about 15 different things you've gotta secure, and you think about 100 different products, that's why I wrote this talk, right? It was just to kind of map it into, and talk about some of the things. And we're gonna do that in the frame, framework of what's called a CNAP, which is a cloud native application protection platform. And, and that's something that like we sell, and a bunch of companies sell these CNAP platforms, but it's not really about that, it's just to give a framework to think about what are the things you need to do when you go and look at a full spectrum of cloud native security, right? So the first one, actually I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide because this slide, this deck was written for 40 minutes and I have 30, so we're gonna skip this slide because we break down each of these in general. So the first one we're gonna talk about is cloud native security, or cloud security posture management. And this is how you protect the cloud in general, right? How do you set network policies? How do you set, um, uh, uh, well, I am actually comes in somewhere, but it's all of the stuff that runs in the cloud and how you protect that. So that's cloud security posture management. There is another piece to it called Kubernetes security posture management. We'll look at that. 
And why do you care about this? Well, we just talked about a misconfigured S3 bucket, but one simple mistake right, can be devastating for companies. And S3 buckets are one of the most common problems that people have making those mistakes, right? So um, anyway, so that, that is why we have something like cloud security posture management to look things like over-provisioned IAM accounts, um, bad network policies, public buckets, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then on the Kubernetes side, there's the same thing. It's sort of like, did you expose your API server to the world? Did you turn off the console? Um, and those sort of things. So now the, the one, so there, there is something like a lot of times, it actually comes in in the next one. I'll talk about it in the next slide. So when you think about that, there's a couple different ways to think about how you can start locking these environments down. So I've listed about six tools on this screen. So the first is, we talk about Kubernetes security posture. How many of you have used KubeBench before? So a few of you, right? So KubeBench is basically, it uses the CIS benchmark. You run that against your clusters, and it lets you know if you're deploying them in, a, in accordance with you know, recognized best practices. Um, so that's a tool that you can use as you're starting to set things up. And then another way to do it is, um, well, it's a question. Why do most mistakes happen? Habit, lazy, humans, right? It's humans. So when you look at something like Crossplane, or and we'll talk about Terraform or Open Tofu, the use of infrastructure as code and to ensure that you're having repeatable processes so that you don't, you can start taking those human, well, so you can do one of two things. You can stop making, you can take them out, or you can repeat the same mistake 100 times, right? Because it's automated. Now you have automated mistakes. But the idea is hopefully you take care of that. So then when you start talking about actually running stuff in the cloud, um, there's these, these tools like Open Policy Agent and Kyverno um, and uh, Gatekeeper where you can start using those tools to instantiate policy. So we talk about like securing network layers. You can use these, these tools. So like OPA, you can go in and define a policy saying, look, you can't run this, um, you know, you can't run this workload unless you have this label or, or some sort of factor on there. And that'll keep you from imp implementing things in your environment that don't work. And then that couples with um, Gatekeeper, which acts as an emission controller, saying if you violate the policy, we're not going to let you run. And that'll keep you secure as, as you're rolling things out, as things get deployed. It'll block things that you shouldn't be running. Once they are running and somebody makes a mistake or changes something, that's where something like Falco comes in. So Falco is runtime security. So Falco runs by intercepting system calls in the, uh, in the kernel, and it looks for violations of things. So if somebody shells into a running container, Falco will write you an alert on that. So you do everything right, and you deploy something securely, and then somebody takes a shortcut or they're lazy, right? Falco helps detect that sort of behavior and those sort of analysis. So, this one is a weird one. So uh, cloud identity, uh, infrastructure, entitlement management. This is all about IAM and access and excessive permissions. And the reason I say this one is kind of weird is that I haven't found a lot of great open source tools for this because so much of this is cloud vendor dependent, right? It's not generic. It's like it's different on AWS than it is on Azure. So there's there are some things you can do in this realm, but this is really one where like from an open source perspective, it's a little bit more difficult. Did, did you attempt the previous Did I attempt what? The previous session? The DEX one? Yeah. I did, but I was working on my slides, so I didn't follow it very well, if I'm being honest. I'm not gonna lie, I, I was not paying much attention. But, but Dex will help with that? Is that, okay. There we go, maybe will. Um, so we, we talked about this a little bit, right? 90% um, of granted permissions are not used. So I mentioned that thing about the S3 bucket. I, I did that because I was using a plugin and it said just give it full access, right? And then when someone said, well, this doesn't work, how, how did I figure out how to make it work? I had to go, like S3 has like 53 permissions on it. I literally had to go through and turn them off and on one by one to figure out how to get the, the base level of permissions. And so it's just way easier. So you can call it lazy, I call it optimized, because um, I'm optimizing my time. But um, yeah, so this idea of being able to go through and audit those sort of things um, is pretty important. So some things in that sort of space about access and entitlement management, there's Key Cloak. Anybody using Key Cloak? So that's single sign-on basically open source single sign-on to help you with that. Um, 
when you have, and then there's a talk on this, I think the next talk's on observability by Tiffany, I think, actually. So she may cover some of this, but this idea of using tools like Prometheus, Loki, and Grafana, which are, uh, they gather metrics, they display them, they aggregate them for you, where you can start looking for patterns in these, these environments. Um, and then the same thing that we talked about a little bit with um, Crossplane is the idea of using Terraform or OpenTofu or Pulumi to roll these resources out so that once you have it defined, you have a, a known set of templates that you can say, look, this is how we define these type of roles, this type of access. Um, so it's not really about detecting it, but it's more about preventing it from happening. So um, the next one is cloud, uh, cloud workload protection. And this is, how do I know that the stuff that I'm running is secure? And this is one actually where there's a lot of really interesting um, uh, open source technology that can help you here, right? So I actually feel like this is the area where we're the strongest in open source. And this is about like container vulnerabilities. 87% um, of container images have higher critical vulnerabilities. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You exactly yes, it depends. Which is the the most people will like you if you tell somebody it depends, they think it's a cop out, but it's really almost always the right answer, right? If I have if I have 101 vulnerabilities, but I'm not using any of the packages, then I don't care, right? It doesn't matter. But people get freaked out about that, um, and there are reasons to be. But um, the there's also this idea of bloat and just using too much of an image, so if you look at something like Ubuntu versus Alpine and the size of the image, um, and, and most folks are out there running on sort of, you know, mainstream distros, um, which include a bunch of stuff they probably don't need, um, and then, um, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff out there, right? So the crypto mining and, and all of that. that seems to be like, has anybody encountered that in the real world? A hijacked payload with crypto mining because it's it's like you have yeah I, mean, I know what happens it just seems to be like one of the canonical things we talk about um, anyway so so how can you do this right so um, you can use something like sneak and during your development processes you can scan for vulnerabilities and you can keep them from entering right so shifting as far left right and then you move to the next step once you have them scanned and you know they're good and you've if you've locked some of this stuff out you can store them up in Harbor. Uh, Harbor is an artifact registry that has scanning and scanning so that if, if you, you scanned it, you didn't find anything, but then a vulnerability is introduced later, you will know that it's there. What's that? Yeah, 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 sorry. I'm hard of hearing and then like <laughs> a little bit. Um, I do have my hearing aids in today though. Um, anyway, so yes, and it's the same thing that we sort of talked about with Falco, which is this idea of like what you put into production on Tuesday, it might not be what's running on Wednesday. And that's sort of the whole idea of like scanning and runtime security and why you have to do it across the spectrum of the environment. Um, and then SigStore, which is about signing and verification of artifacts. So we actually use SigStore Cosign on the Falco project to sign all of our artifacts so that you know that they're coming from, an, oh, it's a French word, provenance, yes, right? So that you know that what you're running is what you think it's running and it came from who you thought it came from. And then that last slide about, um, about like, oh, the bloat and the images and the CVEs, there's a great distro list container image from ChainGuard called Wolfie which basically um, ChainGuard has spent a lot of time and a lot of effort putting together a bunch of images to reduce the CVE count. So like, yes, if you have 100 CVEs, you don't care if you're not running them, but it's still better to have zero, right? Because, because you don't know what's gonna come out the next day. You don't know when you might start using something. So that is an interesting um, option in that space. So. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is cloud detection and response, and that kind of goes across the whole spectrum. And of course, on this one, I can spend a, a lot of time talking about this one. Um, this is basically, how, ma how many know, was it Neo4j? I think it's Neo4j. How many, who knows how long from the time that vulnerability was introduced to when it was exploited? Ten years. Ten years. Right, so I talk about like what you're running on Tuesday isn't what you're running on Wednesday, but this is something that took 10 years to figure out. This was all out there, right? Um, in, in, based on research, right, 
20, 270 days to identify and 70 days to contain a breach. Does anybody know um, what the mean time to pain is on a, on a breach? Mean time to pain is like as soon as, like where they start causing you problems. It's about 10 minutes, right? So by the, when, they, when an, an attacker has access to your system, the research that we have from SysDig says it takes them about 10 minutes to start doing things that you're just not going to be happy about. Um, and that's where tools like Falco and Tetragon can come in. So these are um, runtime security tools, and they, they, are, they actually run the gamut of what they can actually do, because they can look for things like, are you running bad versions of the binaries? Or they can look for things like, you know, you pushed secret keys up to GitHub. Um, Falco has a plugin architecture that lets you basically, I did a talk at a security conference in Canada last year called Nearly, uni uni Nearly Universal Threat Detection with Falco, because Falco has a plugin architecture, and if you have a stream of events, you can build rules on that. So you can, like, one of the guys at work, uh, Toma, he just built one for Bitcoin. Like, so he monitors, like, there's a stream of events coming off a of Bitcoin ledger, and he monitors those, and you can build a rule, right? Has anybody done a Bitcoin transaction worth over $10 million, right? Or, you know, uh, more practically, has anybody pushed um, uh, uh, something up to GitHub that contains the phrase AWS secret in it? or you know, more relevant to what we're talking about today, um, that sort of thing. And then, so that's with Falco and Tetragon, we can be looking at what's happening in those systems in real time as they're put into production. Um, and a lot of time, we spend a lot of time thinking about that sort of front end stuff, or at least what I've seen, people talking about the front end part of it, which is like, let's scan for vulnerabilities, let's, uh, let's you know, Get, you know, we'll scan on the developer desktop, we'll scan in the registry, we'll make sure that we always know what's, what's happened, and then we put it into production, and then once it's running, we don't know what's going on. We're not really, I mean, we know what's going on from like an application performance standpoint, but from a security standpoint, like, how many of you run K Kubernetes in production? How many of you would get an alert if somebody shelled into a running container? How many of you are running Falco to do that? <laughs> what are you guys using for? What, how are you doing it? You're, are you using Falco or not using Falco? Okay. What's that? Yeah. So that idea of like, so there was two people that said, how many of you were running in production? Do it again. Almost everybody. How many of you would know that if someone shelled into a running container? How many of you would agree that a shelling into a container and doing something is an operational anti-pattern that can cause a security hole? Right? So that's the thing, right? We have all these, these ideas of like, oh, we shouldn't do this or that with containers. Um, and then, but we have no way of detecting it. And that's where Falco comes in and Tetragon as well. I can't speak to Tetragon nearly as much as I can to Falco because Falco is where I spend 90% of my time. Um, but Tetragon offers similar functionality. Um, I will actually say Tetragon, uh, from what I understand about it, after it offers some functionality that, that Falco doesn't because uh, this is not America, but let's see if it works in America. If I say if it works in Europe. If I say peanut butter, what's the next word? Jelly, right? And so this is cloud detection and a response, and Falco does not do response. It does detection. Tetragon actually has a response component. Um, we have a nascent project called Talon, which will allow us to do some remedial uh, response on common things. We also have a companion project called Sidekick, which allows you to build out response engines. But anyway, that's enough talk on, on Falco. So. Ah, and I wanted to finish in 25 minutes, and I did. That's why I cut out 10 slides. Um, so anyway, um, the takeaways, right? So obviously, this was just like a quick overview of some key projects. I tried to, I tried to hit all the ones that were either incubated or graduated to give you an overview of that. Um, the general idea, right, there's a big area out there. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about certain buckets, and we don't spend as much time thinking about other ones. And that's why you need to, like, kind of look at it, not just, you know, scanning and protecting and network policies, but all the way through from the moment the developer deploys it to the moment you retire that container. All that has to be considered, and I think that sometimes folks don't think that way. Um, I wouldn't say go out and try to do all of this at one time, uh, you know. Pick, pick it up as you want, and then um, always focus, like, we didn't even get into, like, this idea of, like, zero trust and least, pri we talked a little bit about kind of least privilege-esque, but um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff out there, um, you know, that you should be looking at as well that kind of wasn't covered today. This was not designed to be, like, fully comprehensive in that way. So, five minutes left for questions. 
No questions mean I gave a perfect presentation. <laughs> oh man, I did not give a perfect presentation. You did not mention uh, S bomb. Can you maybe? Yeah, I didn't talk about S bombs or or salsa or some of that that stuff. Yeah. So those are the idea of of understanding um, software bill of materials. And I can never remember what salsa stands for, but. It's the idea of understanding the components and documenting them and putting them in um, and, and being able to replicate them. Um, do you do stuff with that today? <laughs> okay, I didn't know if you had, I didn't know if you, I was basically asking if you had like personal uh, experience you would like to share. Okay, uh, anybody else? Yeah, so um, the, um, Up. The, um, the runtime part of this. Uh, it seems like a lot of projects are focusing more on you know, container image scanning, uh, code performance, you know, everything on the supply chain side. Yep. Um, but like the traditional security vendors who, you know, uh, have always focused on endpoint protection, you know, they have you know, virus scanners and malware scanners for Linux servers and for desktops and all that stuff. You see them doing a play for the container space now as well. How is that landscape evolving? Are, you s are we seeing more open source projects around endpoint protection, stuff running you know, at the runtime side of container execution or, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how you, like, we don't, with our, like, so, I gotta go. <laughs> um, I thought maybe they figured out which passport I used to come into the EU this time. Um, and I, that's a, actually, I have a span, I have Spanish citizenship and US citizenship, so <laughs> it's not, I'm a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so if you think about like containers and the way they live and the way they die, you know, I don't know how much of that endpoint stuff comes in like virus scanning and whatnot. Like we, I do, at Sysdig, we don't do a lot of that. We do focus on the runtime stuff, which is more about the behavior. But your, your first part of what you said was, you know, folks tend to, to focus all on everything that happens until it starts running and then they forget about it. And I think that people live with a false sense of security around the fact that containers are immutable and they're short-lived and, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen if it's running for five minutes? Well, a, a lot of things are, can happen if it's running for five. So I do feel like um, in that space, if you care about analysts and Forrester and Gartner, most of them will tell you that if you're looking at full protection, that runtime has to be a part of that and not necessarily endpoint, but the idea of, of understanding how the containers are being operated and how they're being, you know, what's happening with them until they get retired out. In the back. Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned sort of having less in a container, so like potentially distro lists and things like that, but there are things like WASM and potentially things like CATA containers, which also give a good sort of option there. But how do you sort of see the observability side of that? Because lots of the observability tools aren't as good when you start running things inside a more complex runtime like WASM. So do you, do you see any answers for that kind of thing? I mean, I don't. I know that there's a talk on observability. It's either going on right now or it's right around... I think Tiffany's gonna come in and talk about observability next. So she might have some insight into that. But I think that like, I think that if you ask that question in seven years, right? Because if you think about where we're at with containers, we're about seven years on. And, and Wasm, I feel like, what do you, like two to three years? Kind of where we're at with Wasm. I think that, that we didn't know the problems we were gonna have with containers eight years ago. Right, and I think that's where we're at with Wasm and some of that stuff. So, and I'm not, observability is not my strong suit. So uh, uh, what I can just talk about like from a maturization and how software gets written, when we start getting critical mass and that starts to get picked up, um, I think that'll be interesting. They did have, where was, Wasm IO was this week too, but I don't know where it was. It was on, it was on Twitter. Barcelona. Barcelona? Man, the, you know, that's where I was born, Barcelona. There you go. I should have. I should have. I should learn Wasm so I could go. <laughs> All right. We are at time. I want to thank everybody for coming out and hanging out with me today. Um, and if you have other questions, I'll be around. But thanks for Rejects for having me, and and thanks to uh, all the sponsors because this is a fantastic event. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, for this fantastic talk.